So dear brethren, we thank the Tel Tennessee Valley class for the assignment of our convention theme scripture taken from Galatians 2.20, which is they have referenced for us from the Good News Translation is as follows. So that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. A very important verse indeed, which is profitable to the Lord's people during the gospel age and particularly for those of us living at the end of the age. So with this in mind, we will of course share our thoughts on why we believe this is so. However, our plan is not to just to start enumerating reason after reason and support how we profit from this verse, but would like to approach this subject in a totally different way. You know, many classes that host conventions, including my own class, will sometimes assign a brother to give a discourse on a verse of scripture, which they have established as their theme to their convention. And I strongly believe that this is a good and helpful practice for the benefit of the body. But I got to thinking that through this practice, many a discourse can sometimes zero in or around a sentence or two of an assigned verse within an entire letter, which when looked at as a standalone statement or statements might for some not allow a number of us to more broadly consider the basis of such statements within the context of the entire letter, which in the case of the letter from our assigned verse, which contains 41 words comes from, um, has a total of 2,230 words in it. Or put another way, this would be like our writing a letter to someone of similar length and having them extract a sentence or two of what we wrote, focusing solely on that to perhaps come to some conclusions on the theme of our letter, which might make such ones miss out on the overall import of the entire message that we wish to convey to the reader. So suffice to say, when the writers of the 66 books of the Bible completed each of their divinely inspired expressions, there were no chapter and verse subdivisions or even punctuations and spaces to separate the words in the original manuscripts. Now, if we accept some of the historical accounts of the subdivisions of scriptures, someone by the name of Stephen Langton, an English cardinal of the Catholic Church and lecturer at the University of Paris, is credited of having introduced chapter divisions in the Latin Bible at the beginning of the 13th century. Additionally, by 1551, um, a Parisian printer named Robert Stephanus is credited with having published the first New Testament in Greek and Latin, whereby each chapter was subdivided into separate verses. And this was followed by the first English translation in the 1560 Geneva version of the Bible, but in each case, these verse separations remain the same that we identify with today. Now, it is almost impossible to imagine chapter and verse subdivisions in the writings of any individual today or any real value that would add with respect to our reading such to help make our calling and election sure. And I would submit that this also includes anything written by the brethren during the harvest who are not divinely inspired. To the contrary, how much this subdivision practice in the Bible is to our benefit where we're able to locate and key in on specific divinely inspired expressions for discussion, which we would suggest was through our Heavenly Father's providential overruling. So we will look to do that this morning, including the examination of our assigned verse. But first, we want to take an aerial view of the entire epistle, epistle from which our assignment comes from, including what we know about the writer, number two, their audience, number three, what we would suggest 
was the motivation behind their letter. And then number four, to identify the general themes it contains. And if through this process we can generate a healthy understanding of these four categories, we think this might help us have the broadest appreciation of our assigned verse from Galatians 2.20. So trusting that this approach works for you, that is what we will do. So with that, we'll first examine the writer of Galatians. Who is it and what do we know about them? Obviously not a trick question. You absolutely know who the writer of Galatian is. And unlike most actual letters where the author typically signs their name at the end, the author of Galatians identifies who they are from the outset of the epistle. Galatians 1, 1 to 3. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, no surprise here, the author of Galatians is the Apostle Paul, perhaps the most noble of the soldiers of the cross, barring our Lord. Now, before becoming apostle, we know that at Saul of Tarsus, he proved to be a persecutor of the church, putting both men and women in prison. But after his eyes of understanding post his Damascus experience were open, our Lord used them to be part of the 12 so that he could put his great natural talents in education and divinely bestowed gifts of vision and revelations toward the better purpose of serving the Lord's people. In particular, Ephesians 3, 1 to 3, and particularly verse 6, tells us that Paul knew sooner than the other apostles that the faithful Gentiles were to be fellow heirs with the faithful Jews in sharing in the heavenly kingdom privileges with Christ Jesus even when his apostleship was questioned. Let's move on to our second question. Who was the audience that the Galatians epistle was written to? Again, no surprises to you, as the answer is self-revealing in our question, that being Paul sent his letter to the church at Galatia, which is what Galatians 1-2 tells us. But who makes up this church, and where are they located? Long ago, Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor, was and remains a large peninsula or region in the Middle East, which we now call Turkey. A large portion of the north central portion of this region was referred to as Galatia. Its name came from the Gauls who invaded from the west and conquered the area in the third century BC. And later, it is believed that in or around uh, 189 BC, the Romans conquered it, and Galatia became a Roman province by or around 25 BC. Now, to the south of Galatia were the bordering cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Derby in Lyconia. Thus, we think it's reasonable to conclude that it was in these bordering cities of Galatia that Paul developed churches consistent with what Galatians 1 2 tells us. For example, if we follow Paul's travels during his first missionary journey with Barnabas, beginning in Acts 13, he leaves Seleucia and from there uh, goes to a couple of stops on the island of Cyprus, then on to Perga and Pamphylia, Antioch and Pisidia, and then on to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Acts 13.52 tells us that in Iconium, Disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 14, we read that Paul preached with great effectiveness in that a good number of Jews and Gentiles believed, but the Jews that didn't stirred up the other Gentiles to poison their minds, to cause Paul to stick around longer, to speak boldly for the Lord. Ultimately, there was a plot among unbelieving Jews and Gentiles in Iconium to mistreat and stone Paul and Barnabas. However, he found out about it and fled to Lystra where he preached the gospel and won a large number of disciples. 
However, Paul ultimately experienced trouble there where he was stoned, dragged outside the city, and they thought he was dead until the disciples gathered around him, causing Paul to get up and then go back into the city. However, he left for Derby the next day where he won a number of disciples. But what makes Paul's example remarkable is that unmoved by his prior visit, he returns back to Lystra and Iconium because he wanted to strengthen the brethren and encourage them to remain faithful despite the trouble he had there. He tells us in Acts 14.22, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, which is, of course, an important lesson for us. Anyway, and as a result of these visits to the brethren throughout the Galatia region, Paul appointed elders in each church as we presume he saw the right type of progress in Christ being made in them to serve as their local ecclesia leaders. Okay, we want to move on to our third category about the Galatians epistle. The motivation of the Apostle Paul in writing Galatians. Following his first missionary journey, the record within this epistle, plus what we read in Acts, leads us to conclude that Paul was encouraged by the serious mindedness of the brethren in and around Galatia. This is no different than what we see with the brethren during our day whose lives have been transformed, transformed post-consecration, including those after even a short period of time embracing the deep things of God. With respect to such ones, many of whom are in this room and online, they have sacrificed much consecrated time in studying with and trying to be an encouragement to the brethren, particularly those newer to the truth. This is no different than what Paul sought to do through his visits which is what the Lord expects of us as well. So where Paul saw devotedness, it appears that he wanted to nourish it. And he did that for the brethren in around Galatia through this epistle, which derivatively applies to us. We wanna add one other thought as what we think motivated Paul to write this epistle to the Galatians. While there was well, there were, I should say, a reasonable number of Gentiles from Galatia that came into Christ. A great many of these brethren were Gentiles by birth. Notably for them, many were misled into believing that whatever blessings they might enjoy through Christ and the Abrahamic covenant, they must also become amenable to the law. Therefore, while being mindful of the many central themes laced in Galatians, the essence of the entire book appears to have been expressly bent on counteracting the influence of the Judaizing teachers who came before the believers in Galatia to essentially point them away from believing in the total and complete efficacy of Christ's death for all but rather concluding that it was still warranted to somehow fulfill the law at the same time, if they were to please God. So let's keep this thought in mind once we start to go through the scriptures in the chapter of our assignment. Now, with regard to our fourth and final category about Galatians, we know it's an epistle which is broken into six chapters. However, we're going to break these chapters down even further into the following 11 uh, subsections. Section one, Paul's salutation to the Galatian brethren and the references, chapter and verses are going to be noted for all these. Section two, the stated objective of this epistle, namely to be on guard against any that would pervert the gospel of Christ beyond its clear truth message which Paul delivered to the Galatian brethren, and that any which did otherwise should be a curse. Section three, Paul defends his ministry, notably that he didn't receive it from any man, but through a revelation of Jesus Christ, particularly after his prior, prior life of persecuting and trying to destroy 
the church through advancing Judaism. And we know this because this was his background uh, from Acts 21 to 23, even when his when the Jews later stirred up the uh, stirred up the crowd claiming that Paul no longer embraced Judaism, arousing the people and again, almost leading to his death before being arrested by the Roman troops. Paul not only professed to being a born Jew, but a Pharisee. So Paul threw, went through much to defend Jesus Christ and him crucified. Section four. Now this section begins the consideration of the first of two portions, which we'll spend a bit of time on shortly because our theme verse comes from this chapter. And this portion relates to what we will call the Jerusalem Conference. Now this is the section that our theme scripture comes from and broadly captures how Peter was opposed by Paul. So we'll get into this in a bit of detail shortly. Now as to the remainder of the book, section six, uh, we describe this as the portion in which Paul notes how his faith brings righteousness. Section seven, we describe this as the portion in which Paul outlines the intent of the law. Section eight, we describe this as to what it means to have sonship in Christ. Section nine, uh, describing this as a portion which helps us uh, to see the distinction that Paul makes between being bond and free. Section 10, we describe this uh, to see what Paul means to walk by the spirit. And section 11, uh, for this last section, we see Paul's explanation of what it means to, to bear one another's burdens. So these are our thoughts concerning the very basic themes of Galatians. And now we want to take a detailed look at the verses in Galatians 2, from which our theme verse comes from, and Acts 15, both of which relate to the Jerusalem Conference. We're going to first look at uh, Acts, though. As previously touched upon, one of the things that Paul felt during his first missionary journey was that Judaizing teachers were interfering with his work and causing controversy to ensue while he was in the border cities to Galatia. The nature of this controversy involved the, sh the structure of Christianity, namely the efficacy of the blood of Christ for salvation to both Jews and Gentiles. And specifically, these Judaizing teachers claimed that faith in Christ was not sufficient for salvation, but only served as an add-on to the law to which certain principles of it needed to be kept in order for both Jews and Gentile converts to have a relationship with God. Let's read Acts 15.1, which describes one of these principles. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So through this teaching, the brethren in Antioch and beyond had so much angst in this controversy that they reached out to Paul and some of the other brethren, which ultimately led to their traveling to Jerusalem for a conference with the elders and apostles over this question, which they did despite the expense and time factor it took to get there. Now we go to Galatians 2, which again, from verses one through 10 addresses the Jerusalem conference. But for now, we're going to read verses one through five from the NIV to emphasize what Paul sought to remind the Galatian brethren what led to it. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. 
We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So these verses in Galatians confirms what Acts 15 tells us. While Paul went to Jerusalem to discuss circumcision with the apostles, he first reached out to the chief brethren to seemingly not embarrass them, but give them time to prepare for the discussion. But there were those there, false brethren as it were, who sought to force Titus, who was a Gentile, to be circumcised. However, Paul was not succumbed to the pressure as we see. Titus was not circumcised, which should be a major lesson to us, namely that despite the challenges in standing firm in our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son that we might face, to always dig our heels in and do so. And Paul reminds us as much in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Let's consider the next five verses in Galatians 2 on the effects of the Jerusalem conference and specifically verses 6 through 10. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace God, the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So as these verses illustrate, the council for this conference was appropriately attended by all that needed to be seated for clarity in this dispute. This not only included the apostles and chief elders, but the false brethren who in actuality triggered this conference in coming into being. Nonetheless, Paul's attitude in, pro in approaching this discussion was consistent with what Isaiah 118 tells us, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And so absent the false brethren that opted not to come and reason together because they were false, they failed to reason in graphs that God committed the gospel of uncircumcision to Paul, but this is not what they did. Rather, they should have reasoned to understand that perhaps the greatest faculties that God has given us is our minds. Reasoning, to use the clear meaning of the divinely inspired scriptures, that being the words of our Heavenly Father, His beloved Son, the apostles, and the prophets of old. Reasoning and not allowing prejudices or passions to supersede our personal preferences and teachings of old. Again, come let us reason together. Now, with the matter of circumcision seemingly settled through what Paul preached in verses 1 through 10, let's see what happened next. Galatians 2, 10 to 16, which we will now read. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in, this, in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? 
we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by the faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, this is a markable um, set of verses. As highly as we place our Lord, our Lord's apostles as pillars in the truth, you know, the 12 stars guided by the Lord through his spirit. Why is it that one apostle would publicly oppose another? We're familiar with our Lord's words in Matthew 10, 16, that being, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And one of the ways that we should be harmless is through the words we elicit toward others. Thus, in Paul's critique of Peter, it was not malicious, but it was intended to correct him through an error that God used Paul to convey to him kindly but firmly. And you know what? Peter did not resist what was told to him and not only promptly learned the lesson, but publicly proclaimed it. And this came up a little bit during Brother Matt's study yesterday, so it sort of dovetails together. But what does Acts tell us about this? We're going to look at Acts 15, 6 to 11 to see if Peter gets the point. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So what Peter proclaimed here in Acts had to be after Paul's rebuke of him, with love, we would say, in Galatians 2. Peter learned the lesson that God clarified for him through Paul. It is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. There is no longer any ambiguity on the part of Peter here. Therefore, if we hold on to one of one or more views which are not consistent with what John 17, 17 tells us, thy word is truth, perhaps we should reflect upon the lessons that Peter gained from Acts 15 and Galatians 2, not merely in terms of being given the right understanding to a point, but so that the word of God has a transformative effect on our lives. Okay, we have now reached the point of the portion that involves our convention theme text from Galatians 2.20. So we will now read the portion from which this verse is found in the remainder of the chapter, Galatians 2.17 to 21. And the brethren here in Tennessee Valley uh, have cited verse 20 from the Good News Bible. So we're going to read all those verses from that translation. If then, as we try to be put right with God by our union with Christ, we are found to be sinners as much as the Gentiles are, does this mean that Christ is serving the cause of sin? By no means. If I start to rebuild the system of law that I tore down, then I show myself to be someone who breaks the law. So far as the law is concerned, however, I am dead, killed by the law itself in order that I might live for God. I have been put to death with Christ on the cross so that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. I refuse to reject the grace of God, but if a person is put right with God through the law, 
it means that Christ died for nothing. You know, it, it should go without saying that there is a substantial difference between living during the period of Ephesus, which is when um, I believe Paul wrote his epistle to the Galatians, and those living during the period of Laodicea, a period I believe we are now living in during the final stage of the gospel age. To me, the substantial difference is that there is only a de minimis number of natural born Jews that have come into Christ during our day versus the time that Paul wrote his epistle. And as a result, most of us may never struggle to recognize that the same law which was once to provide special blessings to the Jews suddenly vanished, thus causing us to promptly internalize a new teaching. But that is what Paul did. In a way, that is as open-minded and courageous as brethren from our day have come to leave the systems of Babylon to embrace present truth. So we should lovingly embrace all who, as 1 Timothy 2.4 tells us, come to a knowledge of the truth. OK, so far we have covered a lot of ground leading up to our convention theme text. But let's focus on what Paul recorded for us in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what does and should this verse mean to us? To start, we begin by focusing on the word crucified. Unquestionably, this word is rightfully associated with our Lord, but this act not only began before the death of Jesus, but continued for a period of time after it. As we know, crucifixion was a method of capital punishment used by several ancient cultures, including the Assyrians, Babylonians, the Persians, and Romans. From the 6th century BC through the 4th century AD, and is the most brutal and shameful way to die, notably at the time for slaves and foreigners. Now, none of us have been physically crucified, but we have come to understand that it is a slow and lingering way to die, be it over several hours or even days, bound and nailed to a cross, the pain potentially combined, as was our Lord's case, a hot sun beating on the naked body, a crown of thorns in our Lord's case on his head. It's among the thoughts that we have during the morning of Nisan 14. Think also about the rage of thirst, the feverish temperature felt, and the shooting pains throughout the body that this experience must bring. Such was our Lord's extraordinary suffering. Now, if this is what literal crucifixion signifies, figurative crucifixion must in some way be the personification of this form of pain. In some way, otherwise it's an empty manifestation in all of us in every aspect. Therefore, when Paul says that he was crucified with Christ, he was telling the truth, not just figuratively, but what I maintain ultimately happened to him post his Galatians experience through Nero um, from a physical standpoint. But can we confidently make the same statement? Certainly one aspect of being crucified relates to the killing of all attachments to the law, but beyond that, do we regularly exercise self-denial in standing up for Christ after he willingly, painfully, and humbly died for us through the eyes of the contempt of the world? If so, how do we measure that? 
Are we willing to crucify the fleshly desires and comforts of the world in favor of spending every available moment in service to him? Again, we know that Paul did in order to share with our master and all of the overcoming members to his body in his kingdom on high. But do we? Paul goes on. He says that even though he is crucified with Christ, he lives, but not on his own, but because Christ lives in him. So what does he mean here? The life Paul cites that he lives is the life as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yes, Paul's earthly affections and powers had all been presented to God as a living sacrifice immediately after his Damascus experience. Therefore, and from that moment on, Paul's life changed to conform with what he wrote in Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope and glory, hope of glory. In other words, this begins the process of having the mind of Christ crucifying the flesh and keeping it under in its depraved but yet justified human condition and will. Brethren, this is how the church is spoken of in the scriptures, as a new creation with its ultimate members being specifically mentioned as new creatures in Christ Jesus. Second. Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And guess what? This same verse of scripture is our mana text for today, which was already read. We no, no, we no longer know each other by the flesh, but by the spirit, which is what brings us together here today. I mean... Look, we would not know of each other. Um, we probably wouldn't have traveled here from wide and far away places. But it's through the spirit that we are drawn to each other and how much we appreciate that. So to that end, the lesson we draw is that if we have come to an appreciation of the truth and dedicate ourselves to implicitly serving the Lord, we have reached the point of having a new perspective of life. You know, brethren, these lessons are not new to us, and we have no reason to conclude that any of us see this new creature verse from a different standpoint. But because we are leaky vessels, it remains an ongoing necessity that we reflect upon the covenant of sacrifice that we each previously vowed to keep. We want to view everything from a different standpoint, not letting worldly pursuits corrupt our thinking and activities in the Lord for by so doing, such places are a new creature in a dangerous condition, even as far as life. Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, with regard to the remaining portion of the Galatians 2.20 verse, Paul tells us, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So let's consider the takeaways that we think Paul desires us to meditate upon respecting this. Again, the life here refers to that of the new creature, even though it is cloaked in the flesh, rendering our outward appearance before mankind to seemingly be no different than theirs. We eat, we sleep, we get sick, we have temporal responsibilities, we have typical interactions with the human family, some pleasant, some not so pleasant, but because all of these are part of our fleshly experiences, above all, what should drive us is our desire to live a faithful life unto our Heavenly Father and that of his beloved son who sacrificed his life as a ransom price, which is not just for us, but for the world and mankind. And we draw that from the final statement in this verse. Paul attests that he was living a life of faith as a new creature, 
And we already enumerated a number of experiences during his first missionary journey in Acts and the subjects to which he wrote about in Galatians, which proves this to be true. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 confirms this where Paul says, for we live by faith, by faith, not by sight. We're approaching the end of our remarks, but have a few additional comments that we would like to make about Paul. As you recall, we earlier mentioned the amount of time Paul spent with the brethren in and around Galatia during his first missionary journey. But that was not the end of Paul's dealings with these brethren, particularly after seeing how he was persecuted, being under the threat of harm, and almost being put to death. If we were similarly circumstanced, we must ask ourselves if our love for the brethren was deep like Paul's to return to the scene of the crime, so to speak, uh, where there were brethren living in and under or resist such a return. But in Paul, we see the light of his new creature and his love for the brethren, which compelled him to do so again. So again, if simile circumstance, what might we do? This is something we each need to think about. But let's look at what Paul did. As we know, he made more than one missionary journey. Following his first missionary journey, previously addressed, he followed that up with a second missionary journey. The beginning of such is cited at the end of Acts 15, following the Jerusalem con conference and disagreement that arose between Paul and Barnabas. As we know, Paul wanted to go back and visit these believers with him. And per the account, Barnabas was fine with doing this so long as his nephew, John Mark, who later authored the Gospel of Mark but deserted them during the first missionary journey, could come along. We know that Paul later observed that John Mark was a committed and devoted servant to the Lord, which he confirms in 2 Timothy 4.11 saying, O Luke is with me, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. But before Paul and Barnabas had a chance to proceed with a planned second missionary journey, they parted company over the presence of John Mark. Accordingly, Paul chose to travel with Silas instead. This marked the beginning of his second journey, according to Acts 1541, with stops in Syria, Right. Yeah, in Syria and Sicily, and uh, Syria and Sicily. Thank you. <laughs> I'm struggling with my tongue this morning, brethren, to strengthen the brethren while there. Notably, though, Barnabas and John Mark took a different journey, sailing to Cyprus. So, notwithstanding differences between these brethren. Their collective work to serve different groupings of the Lord's people was doubled. And while issues like this might occur with some of us today, we trust that such roadblocks are only temporary where we might be able to reconvene like Paul and John Mark did for not only the double portion of blessing they attained when separated, but when they later came together. And without question, it is blessings like this which only the Lord provides and allows the theme of Galatians 2.20, our convention theme text, Christ living in them and us as new creatures to prevail. Now moving on, in Acts 16.1, we find that Paul once again returned to communities bordering Galatia, notably Derby and Lystra. Again, we recall his first missionary journey where Paul was stoned in Lystra, but having left there for Derby, he returns to Lystra on his return trip back to Antioch. So this was actually his third trip there. Anyway, this proved to be an important location for Paul to travel to. Let's see what happened while he was there. We read Acts 16, 1 to 5. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek. 
which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra in Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This, ver this same, this very same Timothy was valuable to Paul and the experience Timothy had in traveling with Paul was beneficial and provided him with good examples of devoted service, ultimately leading in Timothy becoming in uh, a pastoral leader in Ephesus to guide the brethren in the Christian faith. Paul comments in 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 11, remind us of this, which he records the following about Timothy. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So the common thread in Paul's experiences in the Galatia territories of Iconia, Lystra, as well as Antioch, was that those false Jews versus those that accepted Christ were instrumental in getting the people to persecute him, but for Christ's sake, he bore it. This is consistent also, again, with what Galatians 2.20 tells us and reminds us as being crucified with Christ. But like Paul, we should rejoice through such sufferings, even when we might foresee potential trouble or challenges through our quest to serve the Lord, believing that he will overrule through all of our experiences. Colossians 1.24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up which is behind for the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. Now for our final illustration of how much Paul cared for the brethren in and around Galatia, desiring to still be an example to those still fairly new to living by the faith of the Son of God, we see how he desired to embark on yet a third missionary journey. Among his stops, once again, included Galatia, and without our being definitive about it, quite possibly, it was after this third missionary journey that Paul was compelled to write his epistle to the Galatians. But in any event, after spending some time at his home church in Antioch, in Syria, Acts 18.23 tells us, and after he spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia, and Phyrigia in order, strengthening all the disciples. You know, Paul's passion for being with the brethren was driven by his love for them, and not merely to travel to see how many new ones he could get to come into Christ. Likewise, that should not be our motivation at the end of the age either, which is a good thing because we would certainly be discouraged in seeing our gatherings get progressively smaller unlike the mega churches of our day, many of whose attendees might belittle our arrangements in a crucifying way, assembling through Zoom to worship versus always face-to-face -face and in large mass, not owning property to meet, not having a recognizable leader through a certified divinity school, because in each instance, such ones fail to see that Christ is the true leader of our separate assemblies all of which is a part of our being crucified with Christ, as Galatians 2.20 reminds us. As Paul sought to do with those in Galatia, we should regularly ask ourselves the question, what words or examples can we set before each other to strengthen our walk with Jesus? And remember, while it is good and important for us to be zealous at the start of our race, it is perhaps more important that we grow in strength each day which follows. Paul would remind us that it isn't enough to make a strong beginning at the moment of our consecration, that it begins, but that we must always be growing in strength. So let's keep that in mind. So brethren, let's conclude. 
from a fleshly standpoint, we look no different than any in humanity. But what, this, but what separates us from mankind is what lives in us, which is Christ. This is what draws those of us that don't live in Alabama to be here this weekend and the many from different parts of the globe to electronically connect to our services this weekend. Each of us could have been anywhere, anywhere in the world today, but what brings us great joy is to be among all that have a deep faith in the Son of God and how his life was given for us as a ransom to satisfy what was lost in Adam, which is, is exactly what Galatians 2.20 tells us. This is manifested in us and breaks through any limitations, doubts, or fears that we might have in no less way than the brethren in and around Galatia experienced during their early consecration, consecrated lives due to the influence of Judaizing teachers. Additionally, we appreciate Paul's reminder to us that he was crucified with Christ. As we offered earlier, crucifixion can be painful from the standpoint of standing up for the truth, particularly when in a minority uh, setting. Standing up for the truth amongst unbelieving family members or neighbors or work associates when serving the Lord might cost us our physical being. 2 Corinthians 11, 23, 28 provides a listing of the sufferings that Paul went through to stand up for the truth. It's a long list, but here we go. Imprisonments, floggings, lashes, beatings, being pelted with stones, shipwrecked, in dangerous rivers, before danger with, from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger before Gentiles, in danger within the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger before false believers, going without sleep, to experience hunger and thirst, having gone without food and being cold and naked. Yes, the life we choose will cost us something, but what does Paul say in verse 28? Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. But why, brethren? Because his old creature no longer ruled over him but his new creature in Christ Jesus dwelled in him to serve the Lord, the truth, and the brethren. So let us always remember Paul's example of sacrifice, and may we strive to be as faithful as he was in Jesus, who loves all of us and gave his life as a ransom for you and me.